Okay, open your Bibles this morning, Romans, Romans chapter 12, and put something in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be continuing in Romans chapter 12 this morning. We're going to read the few, first few verses, beginning at verse 9. The apostle said, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. We've covered all of those except continuing instant in prayer, so we've arrived at that this morning. Now I know that Don has taken it upon himself to talk about prayer the last times that he's been taking my place in the pulpit when I went away. And I did not get to hear last week's message because although I mentioned to leave the DVD on the pulpit, he still took it home. So, <laughs> so I wasn't able to listen to it. But from some of the comments that people have made on Facebook, I think it was a good message. I mean, I don't know. Face, yeah, it was. That's what, that's what I heard. So, you know, Facebook was uh, intermittently challenged last week. So I was not able to listen to it. It was skipping a lot. I don't know, I don't know what the problem was, but... Regardless of that, I'm going to spend some time talking on the subject of prayer. Because not only is prayer an important subject, it is the most controversial subject in all of the Word of God. You may not be aware of that, but I submit to you that it is. And uh, there is more confusion that surrounds prayer than than I think any other subject in the Word of God. I mean, there are several subjects that Christendom is confused about. Like, they're confused about baptism. You know, do we baptize children or do, do we baptize adults? You know, do we sprinkle them or do we dunk them in water? Do we baptize in, in a swimming pool, at the lake, in a pond, or in our baptismal, in the church? There's a lot of questions about water baptism. And of course, you know, you have to ask yourself, which one is right? Are they, they can't all be right. Which, which one of them is right? Or are they all wrong? If they believed what the apostles said, they'd understand that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. The minute you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, that he shed his blood for you and paid the penalty for your sins, the Holy Spirit takes you and baptizes you into the body of Christ. That's the one baptism in the dispensation of grace. It is a spiritual baptism. Now we have a whole series on water baptism. I think there's three messages on water baptism that I did that takes it from the very beginning until baptism today. There's confusion about the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit doing today? Is He teaching me or do I have to study to show myself approved? Is He speaking to me? Is He speaking through me? Is He endowing me with all sorts of supernatural power to accomplish Great exploits for God? What's the Holy Spirit do? There's a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit. There's confusion about what God, God is doing. What's God doing today? What's God not doing today? There's confusion about salvation. Do I work for my salvation? Do I earn my salvation? Is it really, only, is it really a free gift that I don't earn and I don't deserve and I can't pay for it and I can't do anything to get it? Is it really just by faith? There's a lot of confusion about salvation. Christendom is confused. They're confused. And it's no different in the issue of prayer. Prayer 
is a confusing subject because so many people do not realize today that we're living in a new dispensation. That there was a time when God did things with Israel when they were under the law. And God spoke to them directly from heaven. And he did miracles in their midst to prove to them that he was God, that he was with them, that he was for them. Okay? But then we entered into a dispensation called the dispensation of grace. And in the dispensation of grace, God is no longer speaking directly from heaven. God said through the apostle to the Gentiles, for I speak to you Gentiles. I speak to you Gentiles. Before Paul, was, before Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, there was a middle wall of partition that separated Israel from the Gentiles, the circumcision from the uncircumcision. While that wall existed, there was no communication. There was nothing going on between these two groups. But when God saved Saul of Tarsus, God broke down the middle wall of partition, created the body of Christ where there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. And today, it's not Jesus who's speaking from heaven. It's not God who's speaking from heaven. It's not the Holy Spirit who is speaking from heaven. The Bible said, Paul speaks to the Gentiles. If you want to know what God is saying today, you will read Romans to Philemon, the body of doctrine that is tailor-made and custom-fit for those of us who live in, during the dispensation of grace. And there is a person who said, I speak to you. If you want to hear what God has to say for you today and your instruction specifically for you today, there's a person who said, I speak to you. Now, for some people, that's not good enough. That's not good enough that Paul is the one who speaks to us. They think Jesus is speaking to them. No, this says he's speaking to you. So who are you going to believe? This or some women fancy in your thinking and in your understanding. Okay. Now there are people who don't understand the dispensation of grace, and I submit to you, they appreciate the benefits even though they don't understand it. They live in it, they don't, they're not even aware of it. They don't realize that God is not dealing with them according to what their preacher and the law that he's putting them under. Their, their pastor may be putting them under the law and threatening them because of some disobedience on their part. But they're under grace anyway. Isn't that, sad? Isn't that sad to be under grace but being told you're under the law? That's a sad place to be. I submit to you that, you know, the preachers in my past... The pastors in my past were more guilty than the people that they were holding under the law and under the bondage of the law. Even the preachers who don't understand that we live in the dispensation of grace are availing themselves of something that they're blind to. It's very sad. So the subject of prayer is in many cases mysterious to people because they don't understand what to do. Christendom and many, 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 many people who rightly divide the word of truth don't understand prayer. And I mean many, many, many people who still rightly divide the word of truth. For many people today in Christianity, this is their view of God. God is a big vending machine in the sky. Now, what do I want today? What do I need today, Lord? You know, they pull this lever and pull that lever and pull that lever, and they just expect all these things to just come coming down every day. For some people, this is their view of God.
He knows if you've been naughty or nice, and if, you ha- if you've been nice, you'll get good things, and if you've been naughty, he's going to withhold some blessings from you. That's not grace. That's not grace. Christendom has done a great job at reducing God to a vending machine and a Santa Claus in the sky. They've done a great job of that. And Christendom at large thinks this is what God is like. And who can blame them? I mean, that is the pop. I mean, you turn on any preacher today, your radio evangelists, your television evangelists, should say your radio reverends, and they talk as though God was a vending machine. And that he's a big Santa Claus in the sky who's just waiting to bless you. I mean, you listen to some of the TV preachers that got the biggest churches in the world. And every week, you're at a new level in your Christian walk today. And God is just waiting to bless you. That's what happens when you refuse to preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You end up with all sorts of things that are not factual about God. So when we talk about prayer today, we're going to do it within the confines of the Word of God, rightly divided, understanding that there is a dispensational aspect to prayer. We don't pray here like they prayed back here. We don't ask for the same things here that they did back there. That's not how prayer works. Prayer doesn't have visa next to it. It's not prayer slash visa. Prayer slash MasterCard. Okay? It's not prayer slash bank account. That's not what it is. Prayer has been so misconstrued that most people cannot understand what it is. One of the greatest questions, one of the the most popular questions that people have when they enter into the dispensation of grace is, well, how do I pray now? What do I pray for? We'll talk about that. Today, there's a body of knowledge that does not present Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry to Israel, but presents him as the resurrected, glorified head of the body of Christ. That's who Jesus Christ is today, in his ministry today. After his resurrection, after the fall of Israel, He became the head of the body of Christ. When prayer is taught from a Pauline perspective, it changes a lot about prayer in your life. Matter of fact, if you want to make enemies in the Christian world, hold a Pauline perspective of prayer. You'll have more enemies than you, can, than, you can, than you can handle. I mean, there, I've seen people, not just one or two or three. <laughs> I've seen many, many, many people come into an understanding of right division where right division has cleared up so many false doctrines and false understanding in their life about salvation and that it's not by works because they were mixing James and Paul and, and, and they don't know which way to turn and they were mixing Peter, the, the, a, a pig t- you know, returning to his my, uh, wallowing in the mire and a dog returning to his vomit and, and they're mixing Peter and Paul and they're, and they're not rightly dividing. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth and they're all confused and all of a sudden they come into right division and they understand that Peter, James, and John were writing to those people in the tribulation period after the rapture of the church and Paul 
speaks to us Gentiles today, and now there's a, we have a messenger who clarified the message so we can understand it. And all of a sudden, and right division, and it clears up. Oh, the Bible finally makes sense. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when they learn that God is not doing today what he did back here, they can't handle that truth. They can't handle that. They want the God that their old pastors who they left because of right division, they want the God that their old pastor talked to them about. They want the vending machine God. They want the Santa Claus God. They want the credit card God. Because that God makes me feel good. And that God speaks to me. They want that mushy, gushy God, that lovey, fuzzy God, that lovey, dovey God. Now, he is a God of love. Of course he is. But Christendom wants that vending machine God more than they want the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who revealed himself to those of us living in the dispensation of grace. So, I mean, you talk about putting God in a box. Let me tell you, you put God in a box when you say, God, I'm going to pray and I expect you when I pull the lever, something to come down. That's putting God in a, your own little box where you expect him to jump when, when you say jump and you expect them to dance around when you're praying and do all these things for you and you think you're going to move the hand of God and you're going to move the omnipotent, omniscient, eternal God by your little prayers that you say. We're going to talk about that today. You know, if you don't get the answers you want, according to Christendom, it's because either you don't have enough faith or you have sin in your life. Anybody who says you have sin in your life doesn't understand that you've been forgiven all trespasses in Christ. Anybody who says that doesn't understand what the work of the cross did for you when you believed that Jesus Christ died for you. They don't understand that. They don't understand the full and the complete and the eternal forgiveness that you have in Christ. They don't understand that. And yet they'll stand in the pulpit and teach you how to pray, but they don't understand that. You, know, you have to have an understanding of the cross and the finished work in that cross and what it accomplished for you and your new identity in Jesus Christ and what it gave you in Christ and everything you have in Christ in order to talk to somebody about prayer. You have to have that. Understanding salvation and the eternality of your salvation in Christ is essential before you start talking to people about other subjects in the Word of God. When you don't have salvation right, you get nothing else right. And that's a fact. But that's putting God in a box. You know, I don't put God in a box. When I say that God is not doing today what he used to do back there, I'm not saying that he can't. I'm not saying God cannot do here what he did there. I'm saying God is not doing here what he used to do there. That's all I'm saying. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. God himself in his own intrinsic nature, never changes. He has never changed. His dealings with men have changed throughout the ages, and they will change again, and they will change again in the middle of the reign of Christ. The way God deals with men has always changed. What God told Adam, not what he told Noah. What God told Noah, not what he told Abraham. What God told Abraham, not what he told Moses. What God told Moses, not what he told David. 
What God told David is not what he told John the Baptist. What God told John the Baptist is not what he told Peter. What God told Peter is not what he told Paul. God himself hasn't changed, but his dealings with men throughout time have always changed. And now we live in the dispensation of grace where things have really changed. Because everything God did for Israel was visible and physical so they could see and hear God and know that he was with them. Today, we walk by faith, not by sight. There's been a huge dis dispensational change. So, when I say God is not doing what he used to do, I'm not saying he can't do what he used to do. With God, all things are possible. If God wanted to, in one fell swoop, he could heal every disease on earth like that. If he wanted to. And there wouldn't be one sick person left on this earth right now. If he wanted to, that's nothing. But that's not what God is doing. And that's what I'm trying to get into your skulls. Some of you, thicker skulls than others. But that's what I'm trying to get in there. To help you understand. Much of what is practiced and taught today is similar to something that Jeroboam did in 1 Kings in the Old Testament. Bethel, he, he built an altar in Bethel. That's not where the altar was supposed to be. The place of worship was Jerusalem. Notice it said, And Jer Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. He made calves. Like when Aaron, when Moses went up on the mountain, Aaron's at the foot of the mountain making a golden calf for them to worship. Here's Jeroboam making a calf. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month which he had devised of his own heart. Notice those words, which he had devised of his own heart. When people create their own ways and methods to worship God and pray to God, they create a God in their heart that fits their need. A vending machine God. A Santa Claus God. A credit card God. So we're going to talk about prayer, okay? And as we begin to talk about prayer, I ask you to find Matthew chapter 6, right? Or put something in Matthew 6. I have frequently said that you can, it's, you can understand something better when you understand what it's not. And when you understand what it's not, then you can understand what it is. Well, it's the same thing with prayer. I want you to notice here in John chapter 6 what Jesus Christ has to say about prayer down in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites... For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye like, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. Now I want you to look at verses 5 and 6, I mean 5 and 7. Verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues 
and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now in these two verses, there's a lot about prayer that we're not supposed to do in any dispensation in the Word of God. In any dispensation, from Genesis to Revelation, these are things that should never be done in connection with prayer. The first characteristic about heathen, by the way, the heathen in verse 7 are the same as the hypocrites in verse 5, okay? They're the same people, okay? <laughs> so, they're not two different groups of people there, all right? The first thing is they love to be seen of men. They love to be seen of men. In Matthew chapter 23, which is, if you read Matthew chapter 23, it is the, a scalding, a scalding review of Israel's religion and religion in general because it speaks to every religion in the world. But you'll notice that they love to be seen of men. Chapter 23, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. There are religions where the ones praying are gilded and in golden arraignment and they love to be seen of men. A lot of religions are like that. This was in New York City where this particular religion here, there's Muslims, blocking the streets in New York City. Blocking the streets. This is in France. This is in French right here. It says praying in the streets is illegal. Stop it. And they put a stop to it. Because they, they'd go to their mosques, which weren't big enough, and then they'd, they'd back out into the street and they'd be blocking the traffic in the street. Who gave people, any people, the right to, to go out into, and block life that's happening? See? Now, that's religions. Now, I'm going to say some things now that, you know, some of you are going to find hard to accept, hard to receive, hard to understand. Hopefully we'll get into an understanding of it as we progress in this message and next week and the following week. Because this is something that I have to talk about for, for, for the next while on prayer. What are some of the ways that Christians are guilty of praying to be seen of men? It was a kind of, it was a question. It was a rhetorical question. I'll help you with the answer. You want to give me an answer? Go ahead. You thinking of something? Altar calls. That's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But you know what? You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I don't know. But how about this? How about Christians praying in a restaurant? I know. We're going to talk about that. What's the reason? What's the reason for that? What verse governs that part of your Christian life that you pray in a restaurant? Now, don't get me wrong. We all, we've all, we all do it. We've all been doing it. And lately, I have to tell you, I've been questioning that. I've been questioning it. If I were to ask you, what's the reason that you pray in a restaurant, what would you say? Well, in a restaurant. Oh, in, well, restaurant. We're remembering Jesus when he died. Okay. Anything else? Being thankful. She's married to me. To be seen of men. Okay, that's, that's a good answer. To be seen of men, Marlene said, okay? I can tell you that when I was first saved, 
The reason I was told we pray over our food in a restaurant is to be a witness and a testimony to the people who are there. They see you. They see you praying. I'll come back to that, that one in a moment. I want to talk about another reason that we pray over food. At least many people who pray over food, you'll hear them pray. Like you ask somebody to say grace over food, and you'll hear them talk about, Lord, save my mother. Lord, save my brother. You know, they pray for the missionaries overseas. And you're sitting, oh, oh, vey, man, get to the food, man. There's hungry people at this table. They don't want to sit here and talk and pray for the missionary. We'll pray for missionaries later, okay? But we don't want to be praying about that now. Eventually, they'll get to this phrase. Lord, bless this food. Now, exactly what in the world do you think God is going to do based on those words you just said, Lord, bless this food? What's he going to do to that plate of food that's in front of you? You just asked him to bless it. So if it has salmonella in it, or some other disease-carrying properties in it, or because the chef mishandled the food, he dropped something on the floor and he put it back in the pan, or he's got dirty hands, or he's got dirty hands. You're basically, you're asking God to remove those contaminants from that food and bless that food. But let me ask you this. Do people who pray over food ever get food poisoning? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I got food, food poisoning one time in my life. It was in 1982. And the reason I remember, I got saved in 1984. So I kind of remember some of the events in those days. But if I had been saved and I had prayed over my food, would I have got food poisoning? <laughs> Dave's saying no. <laughs> I know you're joking. Yeah, I would have got food poisoning, even though I prayed. Because God would not have removed whatever caused that food poisoning. Okay? But is that what people are expecting when they say, Lord, bless this food? Maybe you're expecting God to remove the calories. Lord, I don't want to gain weight from this food, so bless this food. Okay? Let the fact of the matter is this, when you eat in a restaurant, you take your life in your own hands. And no prayer is going to change that. God's not going to come down and clean up that food for you. Okay? That, that's not going to happen. Sometimes you hear people say, God, nourish this food to our body. Really? I mean, seriously, you have to pray that? Did not God put nourishment in food for you? Are not all the vitamins that you need already put in food from the very time God created them until now? I mean, granted, I know our food is, is depleted from nutrients because of blah, blah, the whole, and I understand that. But essentially, there are still nutrients in food. So do you really have to play, pray for God to nourish the food to your body? Seriously? Okay, now what about now this praying as, as a witness or as a testimony to demonstrate to other people in the restaurant that you're a Christian? Do you really think that praying in a restaurant is a good witness to the fact that you are a Christian? If anything, to me, that falls into the category of praying to be seen of men. Okay, now think of this. Jehovah's Witnesses pray over their food. Mormons pray over their food. Baptists pray over their food. Pentecostals pray over their food. Some Catholics pray over their food. Hundreds of religions pray over their food before they eat. So if all those groups and many more pray over their food when they sit down to eat, 
What makes you think that you're being a witness to Christianity to an unsaved person in a restaurant? Which one of those groups do you want an unsaved person to think you belong to? What kind of witness do you think that is? Which one are you representing to an unsaved person who knows nothing about religion? I mean, just imagine an unsaved person sitting there watching you. What do you think he's thinking? What do you think that unsaved Joe across the room is thinking when he sees a whole group of you sitting at a table there praying? You think he's sitting, oh, what a great testimony to Christianity. I think I'm going to become a Christian now. Do you think that's what he's thinking? Seriously? You really think you're being a witness? Sal said he pr probably gets annoyed. If anything, to that man, you look like a bunch of idiots. You're not a testimony. He's probably saying to himself, because, boy, if I, I mean, if I, became, if I got into religion, I'd have to pray publicly. I don't want any of my friends seeing me praying publicly. Let's face it, unsaved people are ashamed to, uh, of prayer. They're ashamed of God. They're ashamed of Jesus Christ. I got news for you. Some Christians are ashamed to pray in restaurants. But that's how an unsafe person looks at you. Unsafe people are just flat ashamed, okay? So what's the proper thing to do in a restaurant? Just thank God for your food. What's the proper way to do it, okay? I'll, I'm going to discuss that in a moment. I'll discuss that in a moment. But when we talk about what prayer is, we're going to talk about thanksgiving. We're going to talk about continuing instant in prayer. We're going to talk about praying without ceasing. How can a person pray without ceasing? If praying without ceasing is the same praying that you see in Christendom today, where they bombard God with request after request, pleading for God to do something, well, no one can do that without ceasing. No one can do that continually. Nobody can do that, okay? I mean, if, if praying is a constant bowing your knee and praying to God in a continual conversation, no one can do that. Nobody can do that. So prayer has to be something other than talking and requesting. It has to be something other than that. I submit to you that the foundation of prayer is thanksgiving, and thanksgiving is an attitude of the heart which you can be constant in and you can do continually. You can continually be thankful. So if prayer, if prayer is thanksgiving, and it's an attitude of the heart, then when I walk into a restaurant with an attitude of thanksgiving, I basically have already said grace in my heart before there was ever a any food placed before me, and no, not one person even saw me pray. I cannot tell you how many times I have been in a restaurant with people, and they said, let's pray. And I thought to myself, I've already prayed. I've already prayed. Because I'm already thankful. You know, I'm already grateful. You know, I'm in a constant, perpetual unending attitude of thanksgiving towards God all the time in my life. Thankful for my salvation. Thankful for my wife. Thankful for uh, we, we live in a house. Thankful for my car. Thankful, thankful that I'm alive. Thankful that I'm saved. Thankful that I have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I am forever thankful in my life. There is never a moment when I am not 
thankful. Ever. I'm always thankful about that. I have a million reasons to be thankful in my life. So let me give you an example, and I'm going to get ahead of myself here because these are things that we're going to talk about. But I just want to give you a taste of what I'm talking about, okay? Now you'll notice in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, the apostle said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now notice that in this verse, there are two conversations that take place. The first conversation is speaking to yourselves. That's us in the body of Christ. That's us in the body of Christ in psalms and hymns and, spir and spiritual songs. That's communication between us. But notice also, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There is a silent communication between you and God. And where does it take place? In your heart. And what are you saying in your heart? Verse 20, giving thanks. Giving thanks from your heart. And notice, it's giving thanks always. As in, pray without ceasing. As in, being instant in prayer. As in, continuing in prayer. Communication with God is from the heart. And the underlying foundational pillar that sustains prayer, that holds prayer up in your life, is the foundation of thanksgiving. <coughs> Giving of thanks. You know, the world has a day for thanksgiving. We're about to get into it Thursday. I don't even recognize that as a day of thanksgiving. Like I say, I live in a never-ending, perpetual state of thanksgiving. Not one day in the year. That's, that's crazy to me. Right? I know I'm not the only one like that. But giving of thanks, you do that privately within the recesses of your heart where no human eye can see and your heavenly Father which knows the heart and sees in secret, sees your prayer. Notice another verse with two conversations in it. Ephesians 6.18 Now in these verses, we're speaking to ourselves and we speak to God. Okay. Notice in Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now notice where this prayer and supplication takes place. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit within the confines of your heart, in your inner man, not mouthing off in public to be seen of men. Are you worried that maybe God won't hear you if you don't speak out loud? Here's a verse in Ezekiel chapter 11, trans-dispensational verse. From Genesis to Revelation, this verse is true. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. God knows what's in your mind. 
God knows what's in your heart. So in verse 18, we have praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Okay? In the Spirit, in your heart, in your inner man. And then notice in verse 19, the other form of communication. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. When it comes to speaking the gospel, notice your mouth is involved. <laughs> we preach the gospel. We speak the gospel, but we speak to God in our hearts. This is contrary to the way the heathen pray. Notice in Matthew 6, 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You know, I grew up in a religion where they were extremely guilty of vain repetitions. Even now, sometimes you have to go to a funeral, right? Right? And then sometime during that funeral, the, somebody's going to stand up front and, okay, we're going to say the rosary, right? And then they start praying the rosary, vain repetitions, right? And then you look around the room as that's happening, and, and you can't help but very few people are enthusiastic about this exercise that they're being led in. Some are looking at the ceiling. Some are looking at their watch. Some are looking at the door. Some are looking around. They're like, they're just thinking, you know what? This isn't doing very much for me. Sure not doing anything for the guy in the casket. Right? I mean, seriously. Somehow, intuitively, they know vain repetition is wrong. Somehow they just know it. You can tell. Nobody's really comfortable with this. But they do it. Because that's what religion does. That's how religion does it. And why does Jesus Christ say not to use vain repetitions? They think. Notice. They think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think they will. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. God hates vain repetition. He's not listening to it. You need to understand that. I submit to you that Christians are guilty of vain repetition also. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. When a catastrophe happens, okay, like a couple months ago, I received a message in Facebook Messenger from someone, had no idea who this person was, but they, starting a, they were starting a prayer chain and they wanted me to join. Listen, folks, a prayer chain is something heathens do. Do you understand that? Christians don't need prayer chains, especially when you understand that God is not going to do anything about all the requests in the prayer chain and what they're requesting. It was, it was, uh, it was the Houston, the Houston flooding. Somebody started a prayer chain. Well, let me ask you this. What's a prayer chain going to do for a city that has just been flooded? You're going to pray for God to like evaporate the water in one hour or something? Is that what you're going to pray for? What kind of requests are you going to make in a prayer chain? And how is a prayer chain going to change what has happened in that place? That's not what God is doing today. God did not remove any of those people from all of the turmoil and the pain and everything that happened. He did not remove them from it. 
God did not cause the flood. <coughs> God did not stop the flood from happening. And after it was all done, he didn't evaporate the water and make it all go away. Where in the world does a prayer chain come into this? It comes into it by somebody who thinks that they're going to affect something that that's not even what God is doing. You see? They probably think that for, they'll be heard for their much speaking. Hey, the more people we got blah, 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 throwing things up to God, the more God is going to change this situation. All those who joined in that prayer chain were guilty of vain repetition and being like the heathen. That's what the heathen do. So, I'm certain you don't want to be guilty of the same things that the heathen are guilty of, right? So look what else this verse says. It says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now in connection to this, is the thought that the longer you pray, the more God will hear you. When I was saved, I went to a few all-night prayer meetings. And I submit to you that the very thought behind it is the longer we pray, the more it's going to affect God. The more God is going to do things for us. They thought that by their much speaking, God would hear them. The Word of God does not teach that we go on and on and on in prayer. Much speaking does not impress God. The next verse says something again that's true from Genesis to Revelation, verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. So if God knows what needs you have, the emphasis here is on God knows, okay? I used to attend a church in South Windsor, and every Wednesday night was prayer meeting night. Before the prayer meeting, there was testimony, testimonies of how God answered people's prayers from the prayers from the week before. Somebody would say, you know, my grandmother was healed of cancer. And then you find out that the grandmother was on six months of radiation therapy. She lost 100 pounds, lost her hair. But somehow, in their deluded thinking, they believed that God used the chemotherapy to heal that person of cancer. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus Christ send people to cancer doctors? Did Jesus Christ send people to heart doctors? Or did he just heal them himself? And when he healed them, did he make them whole every whit? Jesus Christ made them whole. But now, today, with the invention of chemotherapy and radiation, God now depends on men to do his work. You need to understand, that's not what God is doing today. That's just not what He's doing. Cancer is caused by the things we eat, the things we drink, and the, things we, and the, air, the air we breathe, and other things in your life. Exhaust and pollution, and you name it. There's a million things in our world that cause cancer. God didn't cause any of them. Man is guilty of every single one of the causes of cancer. Every single one of them. God's not putting cancer on people to punish people, you know? I mean, even during those days when, at those prayer meetings, even when I did not have an understanding of what God is doing and what God is not doing, I, I thought those people were crazy to think that way. You know, you hear people sometimes, they had cancer, and they go through therapy, and the therapy goes into remission, the cancer goes into remission, and they say, oh, God healed me. What do you mean? You went, th you went in radiation for six months. What do you mean? Well, God used the radiation to heal me. Well, come on, man. Is it the radiation or is it God? 
I know this is not popular with a lot of people today. I understand that. Because everybody wants God to be doing something and healing them and all this. See? I talk to some people and they say, God did this for me and God did that and on and on and on. And my question to you is this. What makes you so special? How come you have this great blessing of God healed you of this and, you know, God did this for you and your neighbor is suffering and the people in your church are suffering? But you, oh, you, you have this great relationship with Jesus Christ that none of us have. I've been preaching, I've been preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for 35 years, I have never deviated from that message. Everyone who has ever heard me preach has always heard the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been married for 25 years, and how is it that my wife, on the way home from our honeymoon, contracted a disease called sarcoid granuloma, which left her virtually disabled. How is it that my wife never got healed? But you, whoever you are, how is it that you have this special relationship with Jesus Christ, and He speaks to you, and He works miracle, miracles in your life? What makes you so special? Because whatever it is, I want to know. Because I want my wife to be healed, and I want Jesus to speak to me like he's speaking to you. What makes you so special in the multiplied millions of Christians today who don't hear Jesus speak and who don't get healed? How is this all happening to you? Anyway, I was in the church. Prayer meeting Wednesday night, men on one side, women on the other, three, four men would get together. And I have to tell you, even in those days, I was nauseated by the prayers because I'm going to tell you that what they learned and how they learned to pray from their pastor was they all, all their prayers began with, please, please God help my grandmother. Please, God, my car is broken down. Please, God, my uncle is sick. Please heal him. And they prayed as though they cared more about those people than God cares about them. They prayed as though God had no idea that those people were in those situations. And I have to tell you that it smacked of vain repetition like the heathen do. That's what it smacked of. So imagine bombarding God with requests that he already knows about. Vain repetition and much speaking are not pleasant to God. You know, another, I mean, just imagine, just imagine. You have a seven-year-old son, and he stands and says, Daddy, can I have a bike? 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 Come here. I'll give you a bike. You know, like, would you do that? Would you tolerate your children to do that to you? you, you tell, will you be quiet? I heard you. We think God is different. You know, I showed you that, you know, there's, th you know, people praying five times a day. I already showed you this. I already showed you that. What if we did it like this? What if we prayed like this? Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Is that our pattern for prayer? Who's God speaking to here? David. And David's part of Israel's program, Right? Is the body of Christ Israel? No. I remember when I was first saved. I'm almost done, okay? I know we've already gone an hour. I realize that. These subjects on prayer are going to be like this. There's, there's, there's so much to cover. I'm not even close to done, okay? 
So, but anyway, I'll, I'll continue next week. But let me just finish this. When I was first saved, there was a bookstore in the church that I attended. And there was books on prayer, how to pray. And in those books, you had all prayer starters, ideas for prayer, thoughts for prayer, what to pray for. And all those books were designed with the purpose and the intent of helping you pray longer. Your prayer life's too short. You got to pray longer. You know, you got to bore God with more stuff. No, really, it's what it is. That's what that is. But the fact of the matter is this. If we're told to pray without ceasing by the apostle who said, I speak to you Gentiles, can I pray without ceasing if I do it the, the way the books were teaching me to? How many requests can I make to God during a certain period of time without becoming repetitive? I mean, how many can I do? How many, can I, how many can I pray without falling into the trap of vain repetitions? You know in your heart, yourself, okay, when you have made a decision to pray for an hour, which I know is not a common practice among you, okay, so don't, you know, don't, don't, don't try to fool me, okay? I know none of you get there, kneel down in front of your bed or your couch, and you pray for an hour, okay? But some of you may have tried to do that in the past. You may have said, you know, I'm going to pray for an hour, okay? And, and you kneel down or whatever you do, you sit down in a chair, whatever, whatever posture you decide to take, no sooner have you started praying, the distractions start coming. You know, did I leave the iron on? Okay. It, I wonder how my husband's doing at work. Did I just hear the baby wake up? And next thing you know, there's a conspiracy of interruptions and distractions that overtake your brain and you realize you can't pray for an hour. So how can you pray without ceasing? How can you continue instant in prayer? How can you do that? Is it possible to pray without ceasing in light of these kinds of distractions that overwhelm you and overpower you in your life? The answer is no. No, you, know, no, you can't pray like that. So, praying without ceasing and continuing instant in prayer has to mean something other than what we've been taught in Christianity that prayer is. I have books home, uh, biographies of missionaries, Hudson Taylor and, you know, all these great, and boy, I'll tell you, they prayed eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. One guy had worn out a pair, uh, 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 two holes on his carpet where his knees were, right? Because he prayed so much. Well, how do they do that, Right? You can't, that, they, they weren't, no, they, that was vain repetitions at best. That's all that was, okay? So, praying without ceasing has to mean something other than what you were taught in Christianity of how to pray and how to beg God and how to plead for God. So we're going to spend some time looking at this next week and hopefully we'll be able to deliver you from heathen practice of vain repetition. We're going to look at some of Paul's prayers and understand what we pray, how we pray, and how it's done, and how you can do it without ceasing, and how you can be instant in prayer and be perpetually in a state of prayer. Okay? And it's very simple because it has to do with thanksgiving. Okay? So it's not complicated. If it was complicated, we wouldn't be able to do it. So God made it simple. And we have great examples from our apostle. Amen? So let's pray. <laughs> our gracious God, we're thankful that we can gather together around the Word of God, around a book that makes it easy for us Gentiles to understand what you require of us today and what you ask of us today. I pray, Lord, that if any people 
don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they will bow their heart, look to the cross of Calvary, acknowledge their sin, and believe that Jesus Christ died for them, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And by simple faith in that and believing that his blood is sufficient to forgive all their sin, we know that that person will have eternal life in that instantaneous moment of time. We pray that no one would walk away from the cross and the offer of salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.